Gee, it's good to be back with you all, although, you know you get out of practice after a while, so I'm a little nervous about this, but they say it's like riding a bicycle. You, yeah, you just get back up on and try not to fall off. Well, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, when Helene was bearing down on us, remember? Yeah. Uh, Steve and a lot of the staff were out in Kansas City for a leadership, uh, staff leadership thing. So Steve calls me and said, I don't know if we're going to get back. Can you be ready to go on Sunday? This is Thursday, I think it was. I said, oh boy. So uh, I thought, well, and then the next morning I was out walking and this song to me, when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. I thought, yeah, hurricanes coming and then storms of life are raging. Uh, but then he called and said, well, I'm going to get back, so you don't need to do that. I, I mean, I've already sketched out this outline. A little disappointed. I, mean, I guess I'll never get to use that again. And then, as Milton was coming, Marissa called me <laughs> and said, uh, would you uh, fill in for me? So, um, and I came across this really, really, I think, outstanding uh, uh, recording of it. And I'm going to try to play it over the speaker. And I'm going to need your participation because when it comes to the chorus of Stand By Me, uh, you don't have to stand up. Just say, it, Stand By Me. I'll, I'll give you a clue. You'll, you'll get it. Okay? I think you'll like this. There are four verses. Alan Paul. When the storm the storm
So I'm going to take those four verses as the four points of my sermon. Anybody going through a personal storm tonight? <laughs> yeah, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea. I doubt there's anybody here who's not felt that <laughs> at one time or another or multiple times through the day. Helene, Milton, Steen Hatchie, Cedar Key, our backyards, front yards, branches, trees. We probably know people in North Carolina. It's been a tough time. Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, Lebanon. In the context of such huge cataclysmic storms in our world and in our country, we might think our little storm isn't that big a deal, but it is. It is, because it's your storm, my storm. And we carry it. Stand by me. This past Sunday, Brett Opelinski, many of you heard Brett, great guy. He quoted Julian of Norwich, where she said, all will be well, all will be well, I will make all things well. Thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. I wonder if you'd reflect on what one storm that might be in your life right now. A perfect plan that you'd laid out for the next 10 years of your life and boom, something else changed. You get news, you get a phone call you weren't expecting. What is that? Know that he stands by you. In the midst of tribulation, when the hosts of hell assail, my strength begins to fail. Stand by me. Anybody know who wrote this song, Stand By Me? Shout it out if you do. Oh, good. I feel like I should say Charles Who? I feel like I should say Charles This is a gospel. This is a gospel hymn, but uh, that's a good guess. Normally, you know, Charles or John. That's, that's good, John. Charles Tim. Charles Tim. It's quite a story. I did not know. Let me see if I can share with you, because it fits this next one of trials and tribulations. He was an American Methodist minister, gospel music composer. His composition, I'll Overcome Someday, is credited as the basis for the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. Charles Chip Timley, never heard of him, sorry about that I had He was known as the Prince of Preachers, educated himself and became a minister. He was a free man prior to the American Civil War. He had a deep and intimate understanding of the system of slavery in the United States because his father was an enslaved man and because he himself had grown up around enslaved people. Tindley's status was based on antebellum slavery codes, which determined he was a free man because his mother was a free woman. After the Civil War, he moved to Philadelphia where he found employment as a hod carrier. Now, who knows what Tommy knows, what a, Tom knows, a hod carrier. Um, carry bricks. Carry bricks. Now, I did this one semester through seminary. I carried the hod. It was cement. Yeah, I've carried buckets of loose concrete or cement, whatever you call it, which you put between the blocks. And we were working on homes, and you don't need to know all this, but we were working on homes in Kentucky. And I carry that up to the top, and they were working on them, pointing the chimney, and then they and then I'd go back down and carry it back up. But he was a hot carrier, brick carrier, hot carrier. He, was, he and his wife, Daisy, attended the Bainbridge Street Methodist Episcopal Church. Charles later became the sexton, a job with no salary. 
Never able to attend school, Tinley learned to read by sitting by firelight and sounding out letters and eventually words from pieces of paper with writing that he found. He mastered reading so well that later he enlisted the help of Philadelphia Synagogue on North Broad Street to learn Hebrew. He later learned Greek by taking a correspondence school, course through the Boston Theological School. Without a degree, Tinley was still qualified for ordination in the Methodist Episcopal Church. Aren't you grateful for the United Methodist Church where this guy found a home and had an enormous impact? He was ordained as a, let's see, yeah. He was ordained as a deacon in the Delaware Conference in 1887, elder in 1889. It was the practice of the Methodist Church. Tinley was assigned by his bishop to serve as an itinerant pastor, staying a relatively short time at each charge. 1885 to Cape May, New Jersey. Jan, we were there. Anybody been there? No. Uh, yeah? What were you doing there? No, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, you never lived up there, did you? Oh, not, oh, so summer go down to Cape May. Yeah, great place. 1887, South Wilmington, Delaware. 1889 to Odessa, Delaware. And he became eventually a presiding elder of the Wilmington District, that is, a district superintendent. He then became the pastor of the same church in which he had been the janitor. Under his leadership, the church grew rapidly from 130 members to a time where they worshiped 10,000 people. It became known as the Tinley Temple United Methodist Church in Philadelphia. Knowing that background, at least for me, I'm sure for you, when he wrote this song, in the midst of trials and tribulations, <laughs> stand by me. Stand by me, Charles Ellen Tinley. And when he thinks his strength begins to fail, I wonder if you could think of, has your strength ever begun to fail? <laughs> and you worry, can I get through this? Can I get to the next? Can I just put one step in front of the other? We've all been there. In the midst of tribulation, and when the host of hell assail, and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. What a great affirmation. Third verse is, in the midst of faults and failures, when I've done the best I can, and my friends misunderstand, Thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. One of the hardest things in life, at least for me, is when people close to me misunderstand. Do, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's tough, isn't it? Anyone here acquainted with faults and failures? <laughs> I try not to dwell on mine, but they creep up every now and then and just raise their ugly head. Some of you know that I'm a bit active on Facebook. I feel strongly about a few things. I work hard to foster civil conversation and increase understanding. I don't always succeed, I know. I appreciate so many of your positive feedback. And if I were still a local pastor, I probably wouldn't be writing some of the things I do, but I'm not, so I can do whatever I want to. <laughs> Almost. Jan keeps a bit of a rain on me. But. but if and when I'm feeling my beloved United Methodist Church is being attacked, I'm going to say something. And if and when I see what I believe, a distortion of Christianity, a cooperating of it, so that our grandkids can't even recognize that this is anything what Jesus is about, I'm going to say my views. Because so much is at stake. The people are being demeaned and belittled and falsely accused by people in power. I'd say something. 
And sometimes my friends don't understand. One very dear friend texted me and said, I'm concerned about your Facebook posts. I'm afraid they're alienating friends and family. There's a lot of that in there. I bet lots of us here have family who have different views than yours or mine. And I debated about that and I asked people about that and I just feel, at any rate, the election will be over soon and I'll shut up, but uh, we have grandchildren who wonder about the kind of Christianity they're witnessing and I don't want to be silent for them. Jen and I are listening to the latest book by Doris Kearns Goodwin. She wrote Team of Rivals and other things that some of you have read. And this one is the personal story of the 1960s for uh, her husband, Dick Goodwin, and herself, Kennedy and Johnson years. Today, as I rode my bicycle to meet a friend for lunch, she was speaking about the Voting Rights Act of 1965 which Lyndon Johnson proposed a joint session of Congress a week after Selma, Alabama, and the events at the Pettus Bridge, where Reverend James Reeve was killed and others were beaten, John, John Lewis among them. And Johnson invited ML Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders to be his guests at the joint session of Congress the night he was presenting the proposal for the bill. But King was still in Selma to give the eulogy for Reverend James Reed, Reed who had died, who had gotten killed. And in that eulogy, he asked this question, who killed James Reed? And then he moved to, let's ask it differently, what killed James Reed. Because when you go from who to what, it's a whole different deal. And here's the haunting thing that I couldn't get off my mind and I'm glad I was preaching tonight so I can lay it on you. <laughs> James Reed was murdered by the irrelevancy of the church. Oh, oh. Trinity, let's never be irrelevant. Let's never be irrelevant. It was in the midst of injustice. The church was a taillight rather than a headlight, said MLK. An echo rather than a voice. <laughs> I look back on our years together here, Jan, and I remember when we had a call to be relevant when the fellow down the road was going to burn the Koran. You remember that, don't you? In this church, you all gathered together for a gathering for peace, understanding, and hope. And thousands came in their different garb of Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, Christian, and other times. O thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. When you and I have to confront something that we'd rather walk away from, we know he stands by us. Then the last thing is, it's hitting a little close to home these days when I'm growing old and feeble <laughs> and nearing chilly Jordan. O oh, thou lily of the valley, stand by me. Jan and I are reading another, but just finished it, called The Inner Work of Aging. But the subtitle is better than the real title. It's shifting from role to soul. Isn't that rich? Shifting from role to soul. Hard for us to do. You know, you've been doing the same thing all these years. And uh, you, sometimes they're rewarding, sometimes they're not. But eventually, all that's going to go away. And so this hard work that, uh, it's great to read this book together, but shifting from role, the roles we play, to that inner work of soul. I sometimes will go visit a 
older couple, several times a week, actually. It's my, I'm afraid it's my role. <laughs> At any rate, it's, it's what I do. He's a friend. He's discouraged. He wants to die. He's in ill health. He's, and he, he doesn't hear well, and sometimes it's not quite. But I get up close and listen. And I remind him. And I'm present with him. And it seems to calm him. Richard Rohr, a few weeks ago, said, what we need and what we want are not words, but presence and connection. Isn't that the truth? Sometimes you just need to be beside somebody. And that, I will never forget when our kids were little and they'd fall and scrape their knee, they would usually come running to Jan and Jan would kiss their bruise. It didn't heal it, but they sure felt a lot better. <laughs> and that's what I think this song is about. When I'm old and feeble, nearing chilly Jordan, O oh, thou lily of the valley, stand by me. Can I remind you of these four verses? What's the storm of life that's raging? He's standing by you. What's the tribulation you're going through? Your strength begins to fail. He's standing by you. In the midst of faults and failures, and you feel misunderstood, He stands by you. When you're old and weary, he stands by us. Would you pray with me? God, I think it, it, Roar is right. We don't need so many words. We need presence and connection. And that's what we feel here tonight. The connection and power and presence of the Holy Spirit almost feel you standing right beside us. Or St. Patrick before us, behind us, beside us, all around us. You are God. When our knees get weak and weary, when our arms feel like they can't do anything more, you are with us in every storm of life. You stand by us. And we claim this tonight for those loved ones who come to our minds, who are going through their own personal storm. We know you're standing by them. Give them the awareness that you are there, closer than they can imagine. And you are love and your power and your grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen.